This is the Late News Hour. Main news on Five Live. Off Gems Chief Executive says energy suppliers need to explain themselves. And in sport, FIFA President Sepp Blatter is urged not to seek re-election. Over on the Five Live website right now, you can download the Essential Phil Williams podcast for this show, which a bit later on tonight will feature our big 11.30 interview with Claire Lomas, whose book is called Finding My Feet. You may have watched Claire do the London Marathon in 2012 in 17 days, wearing that incredible suit which assisted her to walk over the finish line. Claire Lomas at half 11 tonight. This is BBC Five Live. Basis BBC News. First of all here on Five Live at 10.30, Maddie Briggs. Ofgem says the big six suppliers risk undermining public trust and confidence unless they pass savings on to customers. The prices for wholesale gas are currently 38% lower than at the same time last year and 23% down for electricity. The Charity Commission is assessing whether an Oxfam advertising campaign broke rules by criticising the government's austerity programme. Earlier, the charity tweeted about the effects of zero-hour contracts, high prices and childcare costs, insisting they have a duty to draw attention to the hardship suffered by people. Approval has been given for the Metropolitan Police to buy three water cannon from Germany to deal with the most extreme cases of public disorder. They'll cost £200,000, but the Home Secretary hasn't approved them for use yet. The European Commission is to open a formal investigation into Apple's tax arrangements with Ireland. It comes after a US Senate committee accused Ireland of giving special tax treatment to Apple. And heroin worth around £5 million has been seized by the Border Force Agency at Manchester Airport. The drugs were woven into carpets which arrived on a flight from Pakistan. Two people have been arrested. Five Live Sport. The FIFA president, Sepp Blatter, has been urged to stand down next year by European football chiefs because of the damage to FIFA's reputation from recent Qatar World Cup corruption allegations. Blatter told UEFA delegates that he was seeking a fifth term as president, but Dutch FA president Michael van Praag told Blatter he should not seek re-election, while FA chairman Greg Dyke said Blatter's claims that allegations were racially motivated were totally unacceptable. Elsewhere, Steven Gerrard will be, face to, will be fit to face Italy in the World Cup on Saturday, according to the England boss Roy Hodgson. There were concerns that Gerrard was struggling with a groin injury. Hibernian have sacked Terry Butcher following their relegation from the Scottish Premiership, while Hereford United have been expelled from the football conference. In tennis, Heather Watson was knocked out in the first round of the Birmingham Classic, while there was also disappointment for Dan Evans and James Ward, who were both beaten in the second round at Queen's. And Alfonso Thomas has become the first man in 14 years to take four wickets in four balls, as he helped Somerset to wrap up a six-wicket victory over Sussex in the county championship. This is BBC Five Live on digital, online, smartphone and tablet. And the weather, a mainly dry night for all parts of the UK. Temperatures will drop to around 10 degrees Celsius tomorrow. Much of the same, a mostly fine and dry day with some sunny spells, a chance of the odd shower in parts of Northern Ireland and Northern Scotland. Highs of around 20 degrees. The anticipation is overwhelming. The stadium lights are set at the flick of a switch. Thousands of watts of power illuminate the arena. It's times like these that heroes are made and legends are born. These are our idols. The crowd roars as they hit the turf stage and the performance begins. Rugby Union's biggest hits are on Five Live. The second test, New Zealand against England, live from Dunedin. Saturday morning from 8.20 on Five Live. The Late News Hour with Phil Williams on Five Live. 10.34, Tuesday evening, just before we started, Mark Chapman was telling you about a couple of the back pages featuring injury news, potential injury news, to Danny Welbeck. Uh, they telegraph tomorrow, Welbeck out, striker limps out of training, Sterling in, question mark, says the telegraph. Welbeck in KO scare, the star tomorrow. Uh, the male Welbeck KO fears. And the Times, Sterling eyes starting spot as Welbeck suffers blow. 
Uh, we'll have to apologise to Sam Wallace, who joins us from Rio, Chief Football Correspondent in Independent. I've not seen your back page yet, Sam, but I know that you've got this. And Danny Mills is alongside Sam, and so's the BBC's own Jonathan Pearce. Um, Sam, first of all, uh, when did you first get wind of this? And has this come out of a training session? Were we aware of this any earlier on? Uh, well, if you remember, Roy Hodgson gave his press conference before England trained today. So um, this, this happened during the training session um, around lunchtime, Welbeck missed about the last half an hour it looks like his right thigh n no idea ha how severe it is or whether it was precautionary but certainly it, he came out of the session so that i mean that is significant given that he would have been in most people's sort of probable teams to start against italy on saturday jonathan you've done enough world cups in your time ko scare says the star how scared are you well, the fact that it's come out like this uh, this late in the day, I think, is, is, is quite a worry. And, and because, as Sam's just said, most people would have had him in the starting lineup because Roy Hodgson does like him. But let me tell you here, yesterday, let's put this into perspective. Neymar went over on his ankle briefly in training yesterday. It was a national disaster, an absolute disaster for about four and a half minutes. Right. And then he, he, he walked away and everything was OK. But the, the, the country literally stopped. Uh, because the Brazilian training sessions, everything about Brazil, from the first moment they get up in the day, all the way through their training, for the rest of the day, is on camera. And uh, so I think we just need to put it into a bit of perspective and find out more tomorrow. Danny, what do you make of the way some of the sports pages are, are covering this? Rather than in isolation on Danny Welbeck, they're now saying that this will allow Raheem Sterling in. Are mutually exclusive events well no but we, you know we just talked about it earlier um, you know that is one of the decisions that Roy Hodgson has to make does he play Welbeck does he play Sterling or Lalana you know this might just force his hand it might make Roy bizarrely actually be that little bit more positive you know if he had any doubts in his mind if there suddenly is a an injury concern over Welbeck even if he is fit Roy might suddenly go actually let's go with Sterling you know and if he has a, a, a blinding performance plays fantastically well you know, he will take the credit for that. So, you know, injuries, lots of players have been injured. You know, Ronaldo's had one or two issues. Diego Costa, Ribéry, you know, Falcao's been out for some time. There are players, Royce is out. There are players all over the place that are picking up injuries. But, you know, that always means that's an opportunity for somebody else. Um, and, you know, and we've got a fantastic, well, he might not have even been a replacement because we don't know who was going to start. But, you know, there are, Barkley could step in there. Um, we're obviously got the Sterling as well. And it could be a great opportunity for one of those. When would you expect Jonathan to find out more about this? Well, over the next, I would imagine Ian Dennis is on the case right now, and uh, we'll, we'll probably bring you uh, more, you know, in your programme and throughout the evening, and then there'll be the press conference uh, tomorrow. Uh, I, I would think they'll they'll definitely make a statement about the the team, but um, just, just remember that um, Raheem Sterling can play the wide. Uh, on one side or the other, or he can play him behind the main strikers you're doing for Liverpool towards the end of the season, so he does give options. I don't think you'll play Barkley and Sterling together, but this does give an opportunity for a youngster to come in, and maybe if he, if he did play Sterling wide, then Rooney could play him behind the front runner as opposed to playing on, on wide on, on one side, but I think we'll find out more um, tomorrow from the press conference. Danny, if we do fear the worst for a moment, is it slightly less critical in this tournament than perhaps previous tournaments where Roy has already said this will be a 14-man game? Each game will involve 14 players. Oh, of course it will, um, especially in Manaus where it is going to be you know, stifling hot and the humidity um, incredible. You've always got the likes of James Milner that can come in on, on that right-hand side and do a job. You know, Roy has you know, reasonable options um, to, re to replace that position. As I said, I think the, stro the, uh, the squad up until you know, of, of 13, 14, possibly even 15 players is quite strong. Uh, but when we saw the, you know, the complete revamp uh, against uh, Ecuador, 
didn't quite work. You know, the, the players were out of sorts a little bit. You know, they didn't quite gel together. Um, but no, so I think it, it's a problem. Um, but obviously, you know, it's an you know, every cloud has a silver lining and it could be a fantastic opportunity. We saw in the past, uh, like when Andros Townsend was thrown into the squad, what an impact he made. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm with the rest of the guys. I think it's, you know, it's not time to panic just yet. Sam, have you got to go and refile your back page now or did you manage to get this? Uh, no, that's right, we've got this in the independent, thank God, yeah, so uh, uh, it's, uh, look, I mean, I, I think he's already lost Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain uh, for at least uh, at least one game, he won't want to lose Welbeck, he's a favourite of his, he's always picked him, and uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he, look, he's one down already, really, he's picking from a squad of 22, he won't, really, he won't want his options reduced any further, and, and with the substitution so important as well, um, I think it'll be crucial, I mean, the other interesting part of this story is that Raheem Sterling uh, played most of the training session in that number 10 role. Now, if he was to select in there, uh, I'm not sure that he's ready to do that. That, that, would, that would be a huge decision, especially when, when Rooney has, has played in that role. That would mean Rooney moving left. Um, so the, the, these, he's obviously looking at all his options. Um, I still think there's, there's no chance that Rooney won't start that game, but uh, it's, he, he's being bold and, and he's, he's, he obviously believes in Sterling. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for staying around after Sport to Speak to us. Appreciate it. Sam Wallace, Chief Football Correspondent of The Independent. Danny Mills, who's part of our team, as is the BBC's Jonathan Pearce. Commentary on the opener, England-Italy, well, the opening game for England, I should say, is Saturday night here on Five Live from the BBC. Alan Green and Mike Ingham from 11 o'clock. You can get that Saturday night here with us on Five Live from the BBC. And as Jonathan was saying to you, they've sent Ian Dennis off to try and find out a bit more about that potential injury to Danny Welbeck, who limped out of training this afternoon, which followed Roy Hodgson's news conference earlier. So if you've heard Roy Hodgson earlier saying he's got no problems, that's because he didn't at that point. And then we, we suspect that Welbeck has limped off at the end of training uh, with a, a right thigh problem Sam Wallace telling you about. As soon as Deno knows more, then we'll get the line back up through to Brazil and we'll fill you in on that injury news. Um, very interesting what Jonathan Pierce was saying, there, wasn't it, about Neymar yesterday and the whole of Brazil coming to a standstill for four minutes <laughs> before they realised he was OK again. Uh, we'll update you from Brazil throughout the night here on Five Live, your World Cup station, 10.41. Phil Williams here with you. And let's bring you up to speed with the rest of the day's news, shall we? The energy regulator Ofgem has demanded to know why the big six suppliers haven't passed on sharp falls in wholesale fuel prices. To you, the consumer, Ofgem's own research shows wholesale prices for gas and electricity are at their lowest point for four years. But customers are yet to see that benefit. Our business reporter, John T. Bloom, ex examines today's developments. Contrary to what many people think or hope, Ofgem doesn't actually have the ability to tell the electricity and gas companies to cut their prices. But what it's pointed out today is that if you want to buy gas on the wholesale market to deliver to people's households and factories tomorrow, it's 38% cheaper. It's 38% cheaper than it was at this time last year. If you want to do the same for electricity to deliver it somewhere tomorrow, it's 24% cheaper. That's because we've had a mild winter and a warm spring. The stocks are very high. Demand is very low. Uh, and it's pointing out that's happened, and yet none of the big six energy companies have cut their prices at all. And it's basically saying that shows that the market isn't really very competitive. Why does that matter? Well, because at the moment, Ofgem has one big stick. It can't tell these companies what to do. It can't make them do anything. But it is about to decide whether to refer them and the rest of the energy market to the competition authorities, to have them look at whether the industry really is competitive, whether customers are getting a good deal or not. Now, that is a big decision, and it's going to make it in the next couple of weeks, and it's giving a big hint of which way it's going to jump. That's our business reporter, John T. Bloom. Ofgem's chief executive, Dermot Nolan, spoke to Five Live earlier on today and said suppliers need to explain themselves and prove that the market does remain competitive. I think competition probably isn't as effective as it could be. I think that's why we proposed a reference for a full investigation of the sector to the Competition and Markets Authority. And I think at a time when competition needs to be strong, it's really incumbent upon suppliers to facing this potential inquiry. It's really incumbent upon them to, to show the competition is working well, in which case we should see retail price falls. That's the chief executive of Jim Dermot Nolan. The government says it's doing everything it can to tackle this problem, though it's yet to start a full-scale competition inquiry. Here's the Energy Secretary, Ed Davey. Not only are we making switching easy and simpler for people so they can get these cheaper energy bills that some of the smaller companies are providing, 
but we've strongly supported the proposal uh, for a full-scale market investigation into the energy market. We can speak now to Adam Scorer, energy expert at Citizens Advice. Good evening to you. Hello. And Tom Greatrix, who's the Labour Shadow Energy Minister. We know what Labour would do because you've told us if you were in power. So, But how would you insist that they pass? It's one thing to cap prices. How do you insist they pass on price reductions? Well, our, our proposal is that the companies wouldn't be able to increase their prices. It wouldn't stop them decreasing them. But very importantly, we've said... But you couldn't make them decrease them? Well, no, actually we could because one of our proposed reforms is that the uh, regulator, the re new regulator, would have a backstop power to enforce uh, price reductions when wholesale prices come down so they're passed on to consumers in the same way that, as everyone has experienced in recent years, when prices go up, the consumer bill goes up. That's something which we think the regulators should have the power to do. It does, as you're as your report quite rightly said, that doesn't currently have the power to do that. We think they should do, and actually there's no reason why the government should be, be doing that That would be statutory power that you'd give them. That, that would be, and it would be a backstop power so that if the companies don't do it themselves, then there is the ability for the regulator, armed with all the information that will come from the other reforms from the transparency uh, proposals that we have to ensure that you can understand exactly who's paying what and how much they're paying themselves for the power that they, uh, they supply to consumers. That transparency means people will be able to see exactly uh, what the costs are. And therefore, um, if there is evidence that uh, when wholesale prices come down and even allowing for a period of hedging as, because, because companies by over a period of time, um, if that's not being passed on, then the regulator will be able to step in to ensure it is. And I think that's vitally important to uh, help to get to a position where people not only know uh, why they're paying what they're paying, but they can have some trust in uh, a market where there is a complete crisis of consumer confidence and deficit of trust at the moment. Adam Scorer, we're already seeing consumers react, aren't we? Because a lot of them are leaving the big six. Not in such numbers, no. I think what we still see is a high level of consumer disengagement in energy uh, markets, partially because they see it's all, they think they're all the same and they don't think they're going to get a better deal elsewhere. Look, fundamentally, we have an issue where the structure of the energy market, the way the energy market has evolved over the last 10 years of competition, has got minimal trust from consumers, from politicians, from the press and from the regulator. There's the question about whether the fundamental relationship between the costs of energy, the prices that you and I have to pay, and profits is a fair one. So there's lots of reforms we could, cut, we could introduce, but the critical thing is we get the floorboards up. We get the Competition and Markets Authority to say whether this market works in the interests of consumers from top to bottom across the whole of the supply chain, figure out if and if it doesn't, what are the right remedies? It, it, we, it is really high time that we got the competition experts to take a systematic look about whether this market works or whether it doesn't. And are you still getting plenty of calls at Citizens Advice, Adam, from people suffering fuel poverty? I think we get over about 90,000 calls about fuel debt. I mean, the numbers in fuel poverty has been a bit of change in the, in the definition. You're looking at about 2.5 to 3 million households in England alone in fuel poverty, not just people. We just lost Adam's eye, haven't we? But let's go back to Tom Greatrix briefly, Labour Shadow Energy Minister. You mentioned uh, what you would do, but at the yep. moment there is no such statutory power. So what can the current government do? Well, the current government, I think, should be introducing the reforms that we've proposed, which would give the regulator that power, would ensure there's transparency and clarity in the way in which those relationships work between the big companies. They should ensure we have a proper regulator that's um, that's standing up for the consumer. They should also uh, make sure that we end the uh, the sort of lack of transparency between the generation and supply companies, because whilst, and I've heard it today, I was listening to Peter Allen's interviews with, with Dermot Nolan, with Angela Knight and with Ed Davey when I was driving down from a meeting actually I had with people who work in the energy industry who are as upset about um, the way in which they're treated um, uh, because of the way their companies uh, are behaving as as consumers. But, you know, all these things can change. They should, they should, I think, the government should be adopting those reforms that we've proposed. Sadly, it looks like they're not going to, so we'll have to wait a year. But then as soon as the uh, Labour uh, win the election in 2015, we'll be straight on to doing this because it's absolutely vital that we get the investment we need in our energy infrastructure. But we can't do that while people don't trust what's happening in the market. And the companies, sadly, have demonstrated again even in some of their responses today that they just don't get the level of uh, level of lack of trust there is and the need to properly address it that really needs sure. to change just want to clarify what you just told me there then you said that you've met with people today 
who work for energy companies, yep. and, and they're as fed up as consumers. Yeah, today I've been at the GMB trade union conference in, in Nottingham, and uh, I was meeting with a range of people, including people who work for British Gas and other energy companies. And they get the, they get the rough end of this sometimes, people working in the call centres, for example, when people are frustrated about uh, these issues, and they get, you know, they get the, they're at the front line of it. And they, don't, they feel exactly the same, um, from the comments they were saying to me today, uh, about the way in which sometimes the companies they work for behave and operate and that's you know that's just another layer of the of the lack of trust there is this really needs to change because if it doesn't uh, we're never going to get in a position where uh, where we get the investment we need in the infrastructure and that people trust their energy supplies i want the energy companies actually to be viewed as being uh, making a productive uh, contribution to the economy but that won't happen while they behave in this way and uh, while they are behaving in this way we really need to make sure there's transparency in the market and a regulator standing up for consumers that's exactly what the government should be doing they could be doing we propose a lot of these reforms when energy legislation was going through earlier in this parliament. They haven't adopted them. We'll certainly do it if we get in in 2015. Thank you for talking to us. Tom Gray, Trace, Labour Shadow Energy Minister. And before that, Adam Score, whose line we lost. We apologise for that. Energy expert at Citizens Advice, 10.49. The Late News Hour with Phil Williams on 5 Live. So we've already brought you the back pages then on the Danny Welbeck injury and the front pages look like this tomorrow morning. The Guardian's front page leads with news that slaves in Asia are being forced to work in the production of seafood being sold in some British supermarkets. Tomorrow's Telegraph says a new report is expected to be highly critical of cuts to the armed forces. And The Sun on Wednesday morning pictures Mel B, who has been confirmed as the fourth X Factor judge after signing a million pound deal tonight. Coming up with us on Five Live in the late news, our MPs are calling for more information on why up to 9,000 primates are being kept as pets in the UK. You got a monkey? And as more people find themselves falling into debt just to pay household bills, the Hollywood heavyweight actor Brian Cox tells me how growing up poor affected him. This is Phil Williams on BBC Radio 5 Live. 10 to 11, Tuesday night. Good evening. The Charity Commission is assessing whether a promotional campaign by Oxfam broke its rules by criticising the government's austerity programme.